So uh, today I want to present an approximation theory of deep uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, it's about convolutional nets, not fully connected neural networks, which is uh, different from the classical uh, theory. So here is the outline of my talk. I will uh, review a little bit about the classical least squares regression problems in learning. And then we will introduce uh, the topic of deep learning and the classical uh, theory for fully connected neural networks. And then we'll present the approximation theory for deep uh, convolutional neural networks. And then the connections to the classical fully connected neural networks and uh, a distributed approximation scheme by uh, deep uh, CNNs. So first, uh, a brief review of the classical least squares regression problem uh, in learning theory. We are trying to learn a function f defined on a compact matrix space with values uh, in the set of real numbers R uh, from uh, a, a, a sample set, Z, X, I, Y, I, I from 1 to M. So the sample size is M. And the relation between the sample set and the function is uh, the function value, uh, Y, I is approximately the function value at X, I of the uh, target function F rho. So we model this problem by um, uh, a probability measure on the product space where um, uh, when we decompose it uh, into uh, uh, conditional distributions at each point on the uh, uh, input space X, uh, then the mean, the conditional mean at that point is nothing but the function value of the regression function at that point X. So that's why this relation is given. And if you are giving more and more sample points, although uh, there exists noise, we expect that we can learn this function better and better. That's uh, the classical theory for uh, uh, least squares regression. Now we measure the error of uh, function f uh, from the target function f rho by the least uh, squares uh, error, uh, taking integration of the least squares error over the whole space with respect to the underlying probability distribution, which is unknown. So in order to compute uh, or to find uh, or to approximate this target function F rho, we discretize this least squares error, uh, replace it by a sample mean uh, for a fixed function F, and then we try to minimize this quantity over a set of functions called hypothesis space. So the key is the hypothesis space H, which uh, you would expect that the underlying function should inside of this. So uh, the H should be uh, large enough to uh, contain reasonable functions. On the other hand, should not be too large because otherwise the approximation of this integration by the sample mean uh, would be uh, too much when you run, uh, when you let the function run over the hypothesis space. So that, uh, because of this restriction, the best function you would expect is the approximation of that function, uh, target function, from this hypothesis space, which we call as the target function. So the minimizer of this least squares error over the hypothesis space, but this quantity is not computable. So we replace this one by that quantity this leads another kind of error. So uh, this uh, leads to the so-called error decomposition. In order to study the difference between the function learned and the regression function, we decompose this uh, norm square in the weighted uh, uh, matrix. This uh, marginal distribution plays an important role in uh, learning because uh, it reflects the nature of the data. So this uh, norm square can be bounded by uh, the summation of these two. This term is called approximation error, meaning that under the restriction of the functions on this hypothesis space, uh, how much you can do to approximate the target function F rho. So of course, if H is bigger, then this error is smaller. This is called approximation error. On the other hand, there is another qu other quantity called sample error. If H is larger, then this quantity will be also larger. So you, you do not want to take too large uh, hypothesis space to uh, control this uh, term. So there is a, uh, a bias various trade-off in this uh, process of taking a suitable hypothesis space H. 
I started to work on, on learning theory uh, about 20 years ago when, uh, when Steve organized a seminar on learning theory in 1999, exactly uh, 20 years ago, and uh, I started with the first problem of uh, estimating uh, the approximation error if the target, uh, if the hypothesis space is taken to be a ball uh, with radius r of some uh, function space, uh, and this function space has its own structure. It's usually uh, much smaller than the general uh, L2 space with some structures like the reproducing kernel Hilbert space or Sobre spaces or many other function spaces. And the theorem says that as the radius tends to infinity, this quantity goes to zero at the rate of r to the minus theta for some theta, if and only if the function f rho should have some relation between uh, the general space and the uh, smaller space, and it should lie in an interpolation space. Although the result uh, is pretty simple in approximation theory, but uh, it tells us that uh, we can somehow uh, uh, give some uh, guidelines to choose the radius or the, the bound for the norm of the hypothesis space in the learning process. Uh, notice that here, B is one function space, uh, but in deep learning, actually the function space is very complicated. It's not one function space. Usually, it's the union of uh, many, many function spaces, and that makes uh, the uh, deep learning problem much more difficult than the classical learning theory. So uh, we often use uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces as hypothesis space in uh, least squares regression problems. And here, the uh, RKHS is generated by a Mercer kernel, which is a symmetric, continuous, and a positive semi-definite defined on the input space X. Uh, and well-known examples are the RKHS generated by Gaussians uh, and many other uh, uh, kernels. Now, as I said, there is another part of the uh, error estimate, which is the sample error to measure how, uh, what's the error when you quantify, uh, when you discretize this integration by sample mean, but we want to measure this error uniformly over the hypothesis space. So this is so-called the theory of uniform convergence, which is uh, a classical theory in probability theory uh, uh, more than 30 years ago. And essentially what we want to know is how much, how large can this uh, hypothesis space H be so that this quantity still goes to zero as the sample size goes to infinity. So that means this quantity, we want it to go to zero as M goes to infinity. And uh, this is uh, uh, measured by this definition of uniform Grevento uh, catalytic class. When the functions, uh, functions containing the hypothesis space are indicator functions, just characteristic functions, then this is characterized by VC dimension. But if H contains continuous functions, then it should be characterized by a V gamma dimension or some other more complicated quantities. But most of the time, we simply use uh, same uh, covering numbers to estimate this quantity. Uh, so this is a very classical uh, uh, learning theory. Now, these days, uh, uh, we work on deep learning. Uh, and uh, let me uh, introduce a little bit about the background of my uh, research uh, on this topic. So we all know that these days deep learning has provided uh, powerful applications, especially in two practical domains. One is uh, speech recognition, like for all the uh, 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 smartphones. Um, around the year 2009, almost all the big companies use uh, uh, deep learning uh, software to uh, process the signals, and the error is uh, reduced dramatically. And because of that, uh, we all use deep learning softwares in, in smartphones. The second area is computer vision, image processing. And we uh, already know a lot of applications, very powerful ones. Uh, third area is natural language processing. It's, uh, it uh, also uses uh, a lot of uh, deep learning algorithms. Uh, compared to the uh, powerful uh, applications of deep learning, the mathematical theory is, um, is uh, still at its infancy. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to uh, uh, 
get some theory uh, or theoretical development in these uh, aspects. Now, when we talk about deep learning, actually, uh, most of the algorithms are based on deep uh, neural network uh, architect architectures. So architecture is an important word. It says that the neural networks are not fully connected. You should have uh, uh, structures. So the most uh, commonly used structured deep neural networks are convolutional neural networks, COVNETs. And uh, it was uh, uh, introduced uh, in 1990s uh, in, in this work, and then later on used in various uh, applications, in, uh, essentially in computer vision, which I will uh, explain a little bit more uh, from a computer vision point of view. The second uh, important family of uh, uh, deep uh, structured neural networks are recursive neural networks. Uh, which uh, has been used in recent years. Uh, more and more applications are found, and uh, there are more uh, some other uh, structures. So um, what I want to emphasize is that um, most of the time, uh, in practical applications, we use uh, structured uh, neural networks, not the fully connected uh, neural networks. So as I said, uh, this talk is about deep convolutional neural networks, CNNs. So what is convolution? So uh, let me give an example. Suppose we have an image, say x, which is defined uh, from 0 to n, uh, this uh, uh, cube. So n might be, say, 227. Yeah. So then the image is a 228 by 228 image. And then we use a filter to uh, get some features. So here, s might be 2, then in this case, the filter is just uh, W, it's just a uh, 3 by 3 uh, matrix, a very small matrix. Then when we take convolution, that's the convolution, convolute of the uh, uh, matrix X with uh, the small matrix W, and the value at alpha is simply X alpha minus beta uh, W beta, when beta runs over the set of uh, multi-integers. Because of the support, we know that the summation actually only runs for beta to go from 0 to 2 uh, uh, square on this, uh, uh, on this cube. So it turns out that uh, uh, the uh, computation uh, depends only on this uh, simple uh, filter. So let me uh, draw a graph, I think, here to uh, illustrate a little bit uh, uh, on this computer vision applications. So suppose we have uh, uh, an image. Okay, which is, uh, say, from 0 to n minus 1, uh, 0 to n, for example. Here is uh, from 0 to n. Um, and then we have uh, a, a very small matrix, say, 3 by 3 matrix, which are just the uh, entrance of the uh, 3 by 3 uh, matrix W. So altogether, we have nine numbers, which are the uh, parameters used for the uh, CAN uh, in one uh, process, okay? So what we do is, at each point, uh, we take the corresponding 3 by 3 uh, small uh, matrix and then take the uh, inner product with that uh, filter matrix. So the result will be put at this position. So then uh, uh, we know that if uh, this is uh, 1, 2, this is 1, 2, if the entry is, uh, is on this 2 by 2, uh, uh, two, by two uh, uh, sub matrix, then uh, we know that for each alpha, alpha from 2 to uh, n, then uh, all these entries are well defined, all these numbers here are well defined, and uh, we know uh, what, the, uh, what is the uh, uh, inner product value. So this results to a, a smaller matrix which is uh, n minus 2 by n minus 2 matrix. Of course, uh, here uh, we uh, do not allow uh, values of this original matrix out, outside of this uh, domain. So you might have uh, uh, used the so-called zero padding. That is, uh, when you do the uh, product, you allow entries to be outside uh, the original uh, uh, domain to be zero. So add zero entrance, uh, if necessary, in that uh, product. Then in that case, 
you may get a, a, a matrix of a, a larger size, which is a, which is a, a n plus two by a n plus two uh, matrix. So here is also n plus two. Okay. So in this case, then the um, size of the matrix is expanded. Of course, in real applications, the input is a, a, a color image, meaning that actually the input is not one matrix. It's a three uh, matrices uh, corresponding to RGB, red, uh, green, or blue. And then uh, each time, you first take a linear combination to get one matrix uh, of this kind. And then you use uh, one image to take uh, convolutions to produce uh, a smaller uh, size matrix or a bigger size matrix. Uh, that's one convolution. And then the deep learning is you have to take a lot of convolutions in the process. Uh, that's the so-called deep uh, convolution on neural networks. So the key point is how do we find these uh, values uh, of the smaller uh, filter matrix? And that's uh, the main purpose of deep learning, trying to, to find these values uh, by uh, uh, GPU, by uh, uh, learning process. But the uh, importance is that each time for each convolution, we only use these nine parameters, although you have many, many layers. So uh, a, a success uh, of the deep learning can be seen from this competition uh, of a large uh, image net. Uh, it's uh, about 14 uh, million images. But for each competition, they just take 1,000 images and they try to understand uh, whose uh, algorithm is the best in uh, classifying these images. Okay? So the winner in 2012 uh, is uh, so-called AlexNet. It has five layers of CNNs with the filter size of uh, 11 by 11, 5 by 5, and at the end, uh, 3 by 3, and uh, three layers of fully connected neural networks. And then in the 2013 is uh, eight layers, similar to that structure, but the uh, layer is a little bit larger. Then the next year, uh, then uh, in the next year's competition, uh, we have VGG and Google Net. So VGG Nets has uh, even uh, more layers, 12 layers of CNNs, and four layers of fully connected neural networks. Uh, so for these fully connected uh, nets, for example, in the uh, classical Alex nets, the last three layers have a uh, number of neurons uh, to be like 4,096, 4,096, and the last layer has uh, 1,000 uh, neurons. So although these are fully connected, because the size is not that large, it's only uh, uh, 4,000. So uh, when you take fully connected, it's still like 16 million, which is computable according to the current uh, uh, computing facilities. Uh, but the original image is 200, uh, uh, 228. So even the original uh, image is 228 by 228, which is about 50,000. If you use fully connected, even you have the same number of neurons, it's, uh, it's uh, like uh, one billion, which is too much uh, for uh, the current computing facilities. So then the Google Net, uh, they use uh, not only CNNs, but also recursive nets. So uh, in the recent development, people use more and more recursive nets to achieve uh, uh, good performance. And the latest ones is always better than the uh, human eyes. So the human eyes limitation is like 5,000, and the latest one is always less than 5,000 uh, in top five uh, error. But uh, so you can see that all these are architectures. Uh, it's labor intensive. You have to use a lot of graduate students, but there is no uh, theory uh, behind it. So uh, I try to uh, work on this to, uh, to establish a theory for, uh, uh, for uh, deep convolutional neural networks. Uh, let me uh, review the classical fully connected neural networks. I think everyone uh, know, uh, knows about this. So uh, first we take a, a fine map and then activate it by this activation function sigma and then take, li take linear combination. Uh, so these uh, coefficients wi are uh, are vectors in Rd without any structure. 
So if D is large, uh, like a million, then this has a million uh, free parameters. And if n is even larger than a million, then uh, the number of parameters is just too much. Uh, so that's why the fully connected neural web networks is not implemented if the size is uh, of million, uh, or even sometimes of thousand. And uh, if you take all these um, uh, vectors as rows, and we can put all these rows into a matrix, then uh, this fully connected neural networks, uh, it's shallowness because only one layer, then um, it can be written as a matrix multiplied with x plus uh, a bias vector, then acting this activation function component-wise, and then take linear combination. So what's essential is this matrix is full matrix. You do not impose any structures. But in convolutional neural networks, we have a structure. So that's uh, the difference between the CNN and the classical fully connected neural networks. And activation function often used is uh, ReLU, which is just 0 and then linear over there, a simple spline function. Now, multi-layer neural networks is a, a classical thing uh, introduced 30 years ago uh, already, or, or even longer before. And the idea is uh, to replace uh, the previous structure from one layer to more layers. So starting from the input uh, vector x, you get the second layer and the third layer, but using the same structure. So each time we have a full matrix, a bias vector, and then a fine map, and then activated by the activation function. So you can see that here, each connection matrix has a dj by dj minus 1 entrance. So the number of free parameters is this large, which is uh, too much uh, to uh, be implemented if the input dimension is large. So the corresponding hypothesis space is you take the last layer and then uh, take linear combinations. So in the process, actually, all these uh, connection matrices are free. These bias vectors are free. So there are a lot of uh, freedoms in uh, choosing these uh, uh, parameters. That's why it looks that this is one function space, but actually it's the union of many, many function spaces. And that makes uh, the uh, algorithm or the implementation of deep learning difficult. So uh, there is a large literature in uh, deep learning talking about the convergence of this algorithm when you try to search for the best uh, connection matrices, best bias vectors, uh, and so on. But as I said, uh, if uh, the size is large, then uh, this uh, usually is difficult. Uh, but still, there is a lot of uh, work along this direction in optimization, especially. So as I said, the total number of free parameters in fully connected neural networks is uh, for the connection matrix is dj by uh, dj minus 1, and then bias vector dj. And then you have j uh, 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 layers, and the last layers uh, free uh, coefficients. So a lot of uh, parameters. And yeah. So the classical theory, uh, you all know very well, uh, is about fully connected neural networks. So giving any continuous functions on a, on a compact set of Rd for any d, and we know that uh, if you have enough neurons, then uh, the shallow nets can approximate the function f well in the uniform uh, norm, as long as the number of neurons goes to infinity. But this number of neurons goes to infinity will kill things when d is large, because n is typically larger than d. If this small d is million, then uh, n by d is uh, just too large um, uh, to implement. So the classical theory essentially, th uh, essentially says that if you have some smoothness for the function f, and uh, uh, if the uh, activation function has some properties, then uh, this uh, rates of uh, approximation can be estimated. Uh, there are a lot of work uh, along this direction. Essentially, uh, this is a, um, a large literature of around 30 years ago. For example, the yeah, uh, I started to work on this problem around five years ago when I attended um, a Dexter workshop. Uh, a collaborator of mine, uh, Lorenzo Rosasco, said um, deep learning now is a hot topic, uh, but there is not much mathematics there. 
So you have the training in learning uh, approximation and wave rates. So I think uh, it's your topic to work on. So I, uh, and he was reading this paper of Rushkish Maska, uh, and that was pretty difficult. But I said, uh, all these uh, papers essentially uh, use uh, using localized Taylor expansion. If you find the word of localized Taylor expansion, the, you understand all these papers. So since the, uh, we are using uh, Taylor expansion, so usually we require that the activation function sigma is C infinity. You should have some uh, local uh, Taylor expansion to approximate functions. And uh, that's a typical result. So sigma k is not equal to z zero at some point for all k. Uh, uh, and uh, it decays like this. At infinity, it decays like u to the l, but l should not be equal to 1. So unfortunately, the real uh, used in deep learning does not satisfy neither of these two conditions because it's piecewise linear, so the second derivative is already 0, so this condition is not satisfied. You cannot use localized Taylor expansions. And also, uh, uh, this uh, asymptotic behavior is not satisfied because L equals to 1. It was uh, excluded in the classical work. So uh, only recently, uh, uh, within the last two, three years, then the problem was solved in, uh, uh, in deep learning uh, by Baron uh, uh, Krasovsky two, uh, uh, two or three years ago, and then a uh, paper of Koifman uh, two years ago. And uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, the work of uh, 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 these uh, uh, Peterson and some of the people uh, uh, along this uh, direction, okay? So it's, uh, uh, even for this uh, uh, classical literature, uh, the case of Rilo was not uh, covered. Now, uh, recently there is a lot of work along this direction, especially the work of uh, uh, Tagaski and Yarosky says that uh, if you use uh, more and more layers, it helps uh, the approximation performance of fully connected neural networks. And uh, there are many uh, interesting papers contributed by uh, some people in the audience. Uh, uh, for example, this, uh, yeah, you heard the talk of Helmut yesterday, and uh, all these uh, works uh, are along this direction to show that the depth actually helps if you use more and more layers in deep um, learning. Uh, but uh, most of the uh, work are for fully connected neural networks, and then later on, people can show actually many uh, coefficients are, are zero and uh, it can be deleted. But uh, in the learning process, we don't know. So uh, as I said, for structured neural networks, like convolutional neural networks, there is little work uh, along the, this direction, and that's uh, the gap I want to fill in, to say that if I use convolutional neural networks only, there are structures, how do we get the uh, approximation uh, theory? So uh, I will work only on the uh, one-dimensional case. That means the convolution is one-dimensional convolution, not about uh, images. About images, I'm writing uh, uh, another paper. Uh, so. Since we are in the one dimension, also the convolution is also one dimensional convolution. So input dub, uh, x is um, a vector uh, on z, and when you use w to be um, a finite supported, say support from 0 to s, then the convolution is given by this way. In terms of the input vector x, then this convolution can be represented by uh, a matrix uh, multiplication by a topless type matrix. So notice that the size, uh, the number of rows is bigger than, uh, is larger than the number of uh, columns uh, by S, and S is exactly the size of the filter. So here I'm using uh, zero padding to increase the size of uh, the uh, vectors in the process. But essentially you can see that in the classical fully connected neural networks, the, all these entrants are free. All these are free parameters. So the number of free parameters will be d plus s by uh, times d, but uh, here we only use s plus one parameters, w0, w1, until ws, and the structure is, uh, is very strong. Now because of this, you can see that the number of uh, free parameters has been uh, reduced greatly, 
So let me introduce now the deep learning, uh, deep uh, confidence. So a uh, deep convolutional neural network has uh, this uh, multi-layer um, neural network structure, except that the connection matrix now is a topless matrix. It's not uh, a full matrix with uh, all the entries to be free, but uh, the freedom is controlled only by S plus one uh, parameters in the filter uh, uh, sequence W. So at each layer, there is a filter to be determined and there are only S plus one free parameters in this matrix. Of course, there is a bias uh, vector terms, and I require that the bias vector, all the entries in the middle are the same, because uh, if you look at this uh, topless matrix, you will see that the summation, the row sum here are all the same. So therefore, in the middle, I can uh, require that the bias vector have all the same entries in the middle, which uh, reduce the uh, number free parameters from uh, d plus s to uh, simply 2s plus 1. So then in each iteration, the number three parameters is only 3s plus 2, independent of d, uh, only depends on the filter length s. So uh, and at the end, of course, uh, uh, the last layer have uh, this uh, function vector, and we take linear combination. That's the hypothesis space for learning. So as I said, there are many, many parameters to be determined. All these filter W and these bias vectors B and the last uh, coefficients are in a linear combination. So the total number of free parameters is uh, this number. You can see that even if D is million, for example, if S is a square root of D, J can be square root of D, like uh, 1,000 layers and 1,000 uh, filter length. So still the total number of freedom is like uh, the dimension million, which is uh, uh, feasible by the current uh, computing facilities. So uh, the first paper in this direction, uh, yeah, will appear in Archer. Uh, it says it's about universality. It says that if you give me the filter length as to be between two and a D, D is the dimension input, and uh, we need at least two. Uh, uh, filter length, and for any compact subset omega of Rd and any continuous function f on omega, there exists a sequence of filters w and a sequence of bias vectors b such that one function from this hypothesis space in the t uh, will approximate the function f well enough to any uh, accuracy. That's the universality. Then, of course, we need uh, to have uh, rates of uh, approximation. Yeah, um, a review actually uh, give very positive comments, saying that this is the first, uh, this appears to be the first uh, rigorous proof of universality for, uh, 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 for the uh, convolutional nets. So the rates of our approximation says that if we assume F to have some smoothness, here I simply use the Sobrev smooth HR. Recently, uh, I'm supervising some students to work on uh, uh, more, uh, say, uh, function spaces, not simply this, uh, uh, the classical isotropic uh, sobre spaces. Now, I require that this R to be bigger than half D uh, in order to approximate continuous functions. Actually, I require more, uh, R to be greater than half D plus two. Notice that if D is million, this number is very large. R is, uh, is just too large, but uh, uh, just imagine that um, if uh, a function is C infinity, this condition is satisfied, okay? So under this condition, then uh, the rates of approximation decays like J to the minus half. So D is large, then you can forget about this term, and this is log J, so it's J to the minus half. J is the depth of the deep uh, convolutional neural network. So if you use more and more layers, actually the rates of approximation uh, will become smaller and smaller. Uh, that's uh, in terms of the uh, depths. And I notice that this coefficient is independent of the dimension d because c tilde is an absolute constant. So that's uh, what is nice uh, about, uh, uh, about deep learning because uh, it does not depend on the dimension d. Uh, notice that one special property I used for this uh, CNA is uh, the width increases linearly People often criticize that if J is large, then uh, the, the width, the number of neurons is large enough, although the number of uh, 
uh, free parameters is not that large. So here's the corollary to say that, uh, for example, if uh, I take S to be square root of D, essentially, and a depth to be also square root of D, then the relative error actually decays with the dimension D, uh, like D to the minus quarter. So this is interesting. C is absolute constant. It says that probably the deep learning algorithms performance uh, better and better if the dimension increases. Um, this is only a mathematical result, uh, no uh, uh, computing uh, support at this stage. And then a comparison. The classical Yarosky's uh, results, actually, if you read his paper carefully, uh, that's what I was asked by one of the reviewers to revise the paper. Actually, the constant there is very large because they use uh, truncated or they use localized Taylor expansion. And once you use localized, the dimension appears and appears that the constant is extremely large. Okay. Um, that's uh, the first paper along this direction. My second paper along this direction says that I can show that deep uh, convolutional neural networks perform at least as well as fully connected neural networks. Here I introduce the concept of downsampling, which often appears as poorly in the literature of deep learning. Try to uh, reduce the size uh, uh, of the uh, neurons. And uh, so downsampling here uh, is used in wavelets. We simply take, say, every uh, uh, D entrance, we take one. Uh, so that uh, uh, is the, uh, it's simply the downsampled uh, operation. So what I use is uh, after a few iterations, I use a downsampled. And then a few uh, iterations, I use downsampled. And the main idea is to show that Deep CNNs perform at least as well as fully connected neural networks. To say that, if you have one fully connected neural networks of L layers, then uh, I can find a deep uh, CNNs with uh, downsampling uh, operations, uh, such that the output functions uh, in a few um, uh, layers are exactly the same. Therefore, they have the same approximation performance, of course. And moreover, the, number of, uh, the total number of free parameters in our constructed deep CNNs is at most 13 times of that of the fully connected neural network. So that means with the same order of uh, uh, free parameters, actually the same approximation uh, uh, performance can be achieved exactly. But, but for which kind of, but for so many? No, for any. So here we do not require any input functions. <laughs> Uh, what I said is that for any fully connected neural networks, I can achieve this by deep CNNs. So this is not uh, related to any functions to be approximated. Okay? Then you would ask, uh, that's only a uh, result showing that it's not worse. Uh, can we do better? Yes, we can do better. So here's one example. Suppose we want to approximate reach functions of this kind, g c dot x. So here, G is a univalued function, but C is a vector in RD, which is unknown. So it looks that this is a function on RD, but because of this structure, essentially it's a univalued function. Uh, we can show that if you use fully connected neural networks, actually this structure does not help. That is, you still have to use uh, the same amount of free parameters to achieve the same uh, accuracy. Uh, you have to look at, you have to view this as a function on RD. But if you use convolutions uh, to uh, realize this uh, inner product, we can do much better. So essentially, the theorem says that although it's a function of RD, but uh, if we use deep CNNs, we can uh, have the same uh, complexity as for approximating this unit valued function as a function on R only. So you can see that the rate of approximation is n to the minus alpha. Alpha is the Lipschitz regularity of the univariate function g. It's rather complicated. But roughly speaking, it says that you can view this approximation as approximating a univariate function by deep CNN, but uh, not by uh, fully connected neural networks. I'm working more, actually, along this direction to say that if this is a polynomial of x, not only just a linear function, it's a polynomial, then we can do the same. So uh, this includes a lot of uh, interesting cases in practical applications. If 
the function you want to look for is actually a univariate function composed with a polynomial on, on Rd, then uh, the complexity we need uh, to approximate this function is like uh, that for uh, approximating a univariate function. So at the end, I want to mention uh, my uh, third work, uh, third paper along this direction to say distributed approximation. So coming back to the problem of computer vision, most of the time people use a lot of uh, channels, so-called, meaning that we use a lot of uh, uh, small units or, or uh, local machines to uh, do the uh, processing. And that's the idea of distributed learning, meaning that if the data is too big, you truncate into smaller pieces, and you handle each piece by one small machine, and then at the end, you combine all the results to get uh, a global process, uh, and hopefully the result is good. And here is the same. So here I do not uh, increase the size of the uh, number of neurons. I keep the size. If the input is D, then the size uh, in the learning algorithm is always D. So the matrix we use in the uh, uh, fine map is D by D. It's a square matrix. Still a topless type matrix with S plus one parameters. But we use a lot of local machines. So that is each machine. Uh, we can show that if you use only one machine, after J layers, actually you can produce truncated uh, fine function of this kind for uh, an arbitrary C and an arbitrary constant T. So once you have this, uh, then if you use a lot of local machines, uh, by taking them together, you can uh, approximate an arbitrary uh, continuous functions uh, as you want. So here is one example. Again, if f is hr, r greater than half d plus 2. And then uh, the, if you use m plus 1 local machines, the rates of approximation is with respect to the number of local machines. If m becomes larger and larger, then the rates of approximation is like m to the minus half. So it says that if you use more and more local processors, local or small machines, then you can uh, learn better and better. So I'm working uh, more and more uh, along this direction. The most important one is what about the 2D convolutions, which uh, is essentially used in uh, image processing or computer vision. And that's the paper I'm writing. I'm also working to, uh, to uh, remove this condition by some more reasonable uh, conditions, like uh, what uh, Wolfgang uh, described uh, in your talk about tensor approximation and the structures of this kind, also uh, like Holger's uh, uh, talk. So we are writing uh, actually a, a paper on, on this direction using the so-called solver spaces of uh, mixed smoothness and some other tensor approximation structures. And uh, yeah, that's what I want to talk about here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ding Chung. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. Well, very interesting talk. But just the last result, when yeah. you do approximation on Sobolev classes, in the rate you show, the yeah. R doesn't yeah. show. You, you only need continuous embedding. Right? That's right. That's right. So the rate, right. the rate, that's strange. The second thing, which I, I don't understand on a fundamental yeah. level, yeah. when you take as... Um, Say a compact set in a Sobolev, in a full Sobolev space in very high dimensions, yeah. the entropy numbers of this compact set go through the roof with That's the dimension. True. That's right. And I think a stable scheme can never do better than the entropy number. So, but in your rates, there's no curse of dimensionality. That's right. That's but right. the entropy numbers are fully subject to the curse of dimensionality. Yeah. So, what am I missing? Uh, so, the first question is uh, about R. Because we are using ReLU, so ReLU corresponding to hat function, so it has accuracy. So that means uh, if you take R to be between half D and half D plus 2, we can get a rates depending on R. But we just uh, ask, uh, say, the function to be C2, then the accuracy uh, disappears. That's not my main concern. My main concern is this entropy. Yeah. Okay. In, in high dimensions. Yeah. And 
That's right. So how do you avoid this? Now, we use uh, a Baron's uh, work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for so for so brief, yes. So that's the work, yeah. Yeah. So uh, everything is embedded in this norm, okay? Because uh, this norm is, is very large if you do not impose any structures. So that's why we are imposing structures. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So that's why it's too demanding, I agree. But uh, we are working on that, okay? <laughs> So you started at the beginning with your results with Steve Smell yeah. about yeah. this the uh, learning the basics yeah. of learning and you said okay yeah. uh, if my space approximation space is too big that's yeah. bad for the variance sure. sure and I think you did that deliberately but you didn't say anything at the end because the approximation <laughs> space is humongous yeah. So that's why uh, in the literature of deep learning, people can only talk about local convergence of the optimization problem because the complexity is just too large. And we should contribute more, I mean, not only by the people from optimization, but uh, using the structures of the function spaces, we can do much better. But uh, as I said, the hypothesis space is the union of many, many function spaces with a lot of parameters. So this structure is not so understood. Uh, so that's why I think uh, if you want to do better, you have to make use of the structures of the corresponding function space. But uh, personally, I don't understand this uh, topic at all. Uh, yeah, it would be very interesting for some people to work on this. <laughs>